He who, be, who, he who marries a wonderful wife is greatly blessed. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> you may be seen it. You may be seated. You could just put some high fives up in the air and say, what's up? How you doing? Hello, everybody. Do some uh, holy high fives up in the air. We're so glad to have you here today and so glad you've come out to worship the Lord. So glad you're here to seek his face and to honor and glorify him and to receive from what God has for you today. God uses the praise and worship in our times of prayer. And just like God inspires somebody to give a word that like just laser focuses to your heart, to your mind. And yes, that word was for you. And so there are ways in which God is, God, we are the apple of God's eye. God's got us. Uh, locked and loaded on us, and God's got us in his hands. Amen? So today, I want to share today, I want to talk to you today, continue our message on called, and today the focus is called to connect. Called to connect. You know, just yesterday, I was connected with a buddy of mine. We went out to Peter's Canyon. Everybody, anybody ever been hiking out to Peter's Canyon? Well, this, this was one of, really one of my first times, I think, many, many years ago. I went to a different route, a different direction. But I was at Peter's Canyon with my buddy Peter Garcia, who's one of the leaders in our church. And God uses in many ways to be a blessing and minister to people. And uh, so there I am connecting, connecting with Peter, but I'm also connected with the trees and the, and the dirt path and, you know, the dust in the air and, and all and the heat and the sun bearing down on me. And so here we are, we're hustling, and Pete, like, works out all the time. He's physically fed, he's super buffed, and, you know, he's in shape and everything. And I'm sweating bullets, but I want to be strong, and I don't want to show, you know, any sign of weakness here. So I'm hustling too, man, and I'm tracking with him, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to stick with you, buddy. And so we are going, we're there at Peter's Canyon, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's this big red dirt hill that goes straight up, like at a 95-degree angle. And I looked at that 95-degree angle hill, and I said, what, what's, what's that for? <laughs> And Pete says, oh, we're going to go up that next. And I, I didn't want to, like, say, no way, dude, I can't make that. I said, okay, go for it, dude. I'll follow you. I'm, I'm in. I'm on it. And so we get up to the top of this 95-degree hill, this big red hill. We get up to the top. And by the time we get to the top, man, I'm dying. And I said, Pete, I said, is there, like, a slide that gets us back down or a hang gliding station, man? <laughs> And it is a true story, but uh, while I was there, you know, I, was, I didn't realize until this morning, my whole lower half of my body is super sore. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Woo, it worked. Boy, I'm getting in shape. But today, uh, while I was out there, it, something really occurred to me. When I'm, I'm talking today about a call to connect. And we've been called to connect as members of the body. We've been called to connect as members of the body. You know, last week, Pastor Danny Jr. got up here and he says, you know, we have a beautiful building, a beautiful church building. And God has been faithful and God has worked and brought all these things about. But the building is absolutely nothing without the people because the people are that church. Can somebody say amen? You know, when Pastor Jenny Jr. shared that, it really spoke to my heart. It really encouraged me. The church really is the body. The church really is the people. And when people are detached from the body, just like a, a limb detached from the body, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to keep going. It's hard to stay alive. And it's hard, to, it's hard not to grow cold when we're detached from the body. And so one of the things that occurred to me when I was out in the woods and I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the, the, the woods and things of that nature and I was appreciated and while I was sweating bullets, right? When I got home and as I was preparing for the message later that evening, one of the things that occurred to me were the redwood trees. You ever see a redwood tree? I know uh, we've gone on a trip before and, and we've walked up on some ginormous trees. Come to find out later that they were redwood trees. And they're just huge, but, but they're the redwood tree, and there are more than 500 in California. They're the largest living trees in the world. They're 300 feet to 350 feet high. And I thought to myself, well, how, how high is that? If there were an elevator and you could press, take me to the 30th floor, that would be a redwood tree. So you would press, take me to the 30th floor, and you'd get up to the 30th floor, and you would be at the, at, the, at the top, at the height of a redwood tree. Some go 300 to 350, so imagine that. 
But then the redwood tree, is, it's, it's th about 30 feet wide. 30 feet wide, if you look at the platform, it's like from one, one angle of the entrance here where the steps are, the, in, the, the, the entrance, the, the, the outline, the border there to where the steps are, all the way over here to where the other side of the steps are. So a redwood tree is 30 floors high and, or more and about 30 feet wide. Huge, the, the biggest, tallest living trees in the world on the face of the earth. Huge trees. And you would expect, you would think to yourself, wow, something that big, something that tall, something that wide, the biggest, tallest, and, and, and if, if, you're in the, if you're in the body, the baddest trees in the world. How I many know what I'm talking about? That's a bad tree, brother. You would think that, man, their roots must go 20, 30, 40, 50 feet deep. You would think that they had really deep roots. And the truth of the matter is, if you look them up, if the truth of the matter is, the roots only go about five feet down. Five feet low, five feet beneath the earth. Five feet is basically the height of this platform. So the, the tallest trees in the world... Tallest and the widest in that way, so 30 feet wide, or excuse me, 300, 300 feet of, uh, tall, 30 stories high. And, and their roots only go about five to six feet below, which is the, the, the highest platform. But you know what else I learned? Here's what else I learned. That the way the, the redwood tree Stay standing tall and strong and healthy and wide is that the roots of the red tree extend up to 100 feet from the center of that tree. 100 feet is almost where the doors are. We walked it off. It's where the light booth that, where the sound booth that. So 100 feet in every direction. The radius of those roots, each 100 feet in every direction. And the roots of a redwood tree, they, they seek out one another. They seek to lock into each other. They seek to wrap around one another. As a matter of fact, the roots of the redwood tree don't just interlock and interweave and connect to each other and converge. They also fuse together. They're so close, they become family. How many know what I'm talking about? They're so close, they're not just best friends. They're so close, they're, they're intimately connected and related to one another, and they stand as one. The only way that a tree that tall and that wide is able to stay standing is because it is connected, it is held up, literally, by the other trees around it. The redwood tree is held up, literally, by the redwood tree other redwood trees around it. The redwood trees, the tallest, baddest, most amazing trees in the world need one another to survive. Isn't that amazing? You know, I stopped to think about the sermon today and I stopped to think about call to connect and I thought to myself, I think there's something here for us as a church. I think there's something here for us as a church. And it's not, it's not united we stand and divided we fall. But God has called us to be united. Because when we're united, there's a way in which we literally hold one another up as a church, as a family, as a community, as the body of Christ. We hold one another up. So no matter what the winds and the waves and the floods and, and, or even the fires that come our way, we are able to stay standing because we're in interrelated, interconnected, and we have even become familia to one another. Come on, somebody, say amen. Call to connect. I think the same, same principles apply. We have been called to connect. You know, as a church, as friends and families and loved ones, when God calls us together, God's called us to connect. God's called us to hold one another up. Because we need each other to stay standing. You know, as we look into the text today, here's kind of what I want to flesh out today. God's calling us to connect so that we can hold one another up. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at Hebrews together. We'll start off at verse 23 and work our way to verse 25. 
So let's see what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Everybody say hold. And then the next verse says, let us think of the ways to motivate one another to acts of love and, and good works. Everybody say motivate. And then verse 25 says, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Everybody say meet. There's this meeting together that happens that the scripture refers us to in verse 25. And I want to relate this to what I just said about redwood trees. How can we hold one another up? God's called us to connect. We've been called to connect. We are the body of Christ. Outside of the body, detached from the body, it's hard for us to stay alive. But God calls us to connect, to unite, to fight, to converge, to interrelate, to interweave, to be woven together in the fabric of life and the story of our lives and what we call a testimony and to give witness to the story of Jesus Christ. And yet our lives are fused together, grafted in, the Bible says, in terms of of. Uh, uh, of Christians and believers grafted into who God is and what God has done. And so today we're talking about how to hold one another up. And you know, it really starts off right there in the beginning of the verse 23. It says, hold on. Hold on. That's really where it begins. It begins with not letting go. Come on, somebody. It begins with not quitting, not giving up. It, 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 it's about holding on. So this, 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 this coming together, this calling to connect, it is about holding on. And when I think about holding on, uh, you know, I think about Disneyland. And, you know, the, the, the uh, roller coaster now is the Incredicoaster, right? I can remember getting on that, and I'm not a big coaster fan because it does interesting things to my stomach. In the name of Jesus, I'm praying the whole time, right? I'm the one you don't want to sit behind. Come on, somebody. How many know what I'm talking about? And so, so the way in which when you get on that thing, you hold on for life and limb, right? And you do not let go until it's over. Well, at least I do. My kids, they raise their hands. They're talking, laughing, telling me stories, you know, while I'm holding on to my life. And they're like, are you okay, Dad? No, I'm not okay. Can't you see? I'm holding on. But the Bible says we are to hold on, the Bible says. And it's interesting because right now life is like a roller coaster. Right now, life can be like that roller coaster, and you don't really know what's coming on the other side of that turn. You're not really sure how many loops you're going to make or how many loops you're going to have to do because one thing seems to come right after another and surprise, one surprise right after another. And so the Bible says to hold on, not to the roller coaster rails, but to hold on to God. To hold on to the promises of God, to hold on to the hope in God, because God is going to fulfill God's promise. Hold on, the Bible says, hold on to hope. Hold on to hope. Because God keeps his promises. You know, it doesn't matter how bad it gets, the Bible says, hold on. Hold on, to hold on to hope in God. Hold on to hope. You know, when, when, I, when I was thinking about this, and uh, kind of praying and, and, and thinking, you know, Lord, give me something here to work with. It, it occurred to me, you know that great leader, Nelson Mandela, that kind of uh, God used to, to really end the apartheid in South Africa and his amazing accomplishment. He was, I didn't know he was in prison for 27 years. I mean, we've been on quarantine since March. Come on, somebody. The, uh, we went on lockdown, a restriction, one thing. Can you imagine 27 years? In 27 years, he, here he is on lockdown, here he is in prison, here he is in, in actually in a really heavy-duty uh, uh, kind of confinement and, and, and breaking all these rocks and stones, a uh, uh, heavy labor kind of confinement. So 27 years, here he is, and, and yet he's, he's committed to the hope, to the possibility that one day there would be a free South Africa, that one day, and that day ultimately came in 1994, in the 1990s, when the apartheid was ultimately brought to an end. And here's Nelson Mandela holding on for 27 years in a hope and in a dream that one day this would be brought about. And here's something that he said that really caught my eye. He said, a winner is a dreamer who never gives up. 
A winner is a dreamer who never gives up. And when I, when I thought about that, I thought, look at how, how God's telling us to hold on. Why? Because we've already won if we don't let go. And you want to know something? You want to know something that occurred to me? What, what I realized and, and just my, my, my own brokenness and my frailty and my imperfection. I thought, oh, Lord, there are so many times that, that it's easier to let go. And then sometimes I need you to know and I, and I want you to know that the reason you're still here, the reason you're still going, the reason you're still up, the reason you're still running, it's not because we're so good at holding on, but that God is so good at holding on to us. Come on, somebody, say amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. That's true. God is holding on to us. God is holding on to you, baby girl, baby boy. Mijo, mija, God is holding on to you, mom and dad. God is holding on to you, young brother, young sister. God is holding on to you, abuelita, abuelito. God is holding on to you too. You know what then the Bible says when we talk about holding one another up so that we can stand strong against the trials and temptations and tribulations and testing. You know what the Bible says, how we are to hold one another up? Look at verse 24. It says, it says to motivate each other. So, so we start, we, we're able to hold one another up because, number one, we're holding on to hope. But then the Bible says to motivate each other. In a sense, it's like, it's like uh, you motivate each other. You propel someone in a particular direction. You move them. You, 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 you do something that, that causes this forward progress or it, 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 it lights something up that would motivate them, that would move them forward. And the Bible says very specifically, very specifically, motivate each other to love. Motivate each other to love. Isn't that amazing that the scripture would call us to be excellent at loving each other? To be excellent at loving one another. To be excellent at, at, at going all in to win in this way. When you, and when you love God and, and this love flows out of your heart, what happens? When you love God and this love flows out of your heart and you're bound together, united together, intertwined together, interlocked together, and even fused with the lives of others, what happens? Your love begins to impact. Your love begins to motivate. It begins to, in, it begins to make a difference and inspire the lives of others so much so that they begin begin to benefit from and share in and, and, and come partakers in what God is doing in and through you. There's this uh, early church father by the name of Augustine. Early church father by the name of Augustine who said, essentially, one burning heart lights another one on fire. You know, when I talk about, I thought about church and, and, and all of us gathered together online uh, in it to win it. All of us kind of participating and joined together even here physically as well as what God does in our life groups and what God is doing in our connect groups. Excuse me, whether they're online or whether they're in person, whether they're in backyards or parks or wh whether they're meeting for coffee in outdoor spaces. Whatever the case may be, the, what Augustine said was one burning heart turns another one on fire. You know what encouraged me when I, when I thought about when we come together? It's like the fellowship of the burning hearts. It's like the fellowship of the burning hearts. It, where, it's where, it's where it, it, when something is lit. And you come together. It's like you benefit in what is happening there. You benefit in the warmth. You benefit in the fire. Hopefully you don't choke on the smoke. Come on, somebody. But do you benefit in what's taking place there? You benefit in, in, in the motivation that happens when we all gather together. There's an overflow of God's goodness, of God's grace. And look at what, it doesn't stop there. It says, it says motivate each other to love. And then it says, and good works. You know, when I was reading this, I was kind of reading really fast and I was trying to get over the, the good works part of it. And, and so here we are, we're holding on to hope and then it's, it's motivating each other to, to, to love and good works. And when I thought about it, I thought, hey, wait a second. So we're, we're not just to, to love one another and make a difference in the lives of others and, and be united uh, to stand and, and endure and, and benefit and be a blessing and bless the blessed. But there's a sense in which that we are to, we are to motivate each other to love and good works. And, and when we are united together, when we are standing together, when we're connected, we're fruitful. When we're connected, we're fruitful. 
When we're connected, we're doing good. When we're connected, we're encouraged to do good. We're supported to do good. We're, 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 we're counseled to do well. We're advised to do well. The word of God begins to be applied to our lives. And we get fed and we get nourished. We get encouraged so that we can go do more. How many of you know the Bible says God gives seed to the sower? So God gives seed to the sower because God has given it to the one who's giving out. Come on, somebody. As, 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 as you're united and you're connected, what happens when you're united and you're connected, you become rooted. You become planted. And when you're, you're united and you're connected and you're planted, you're able to produce fruit because your roots are in good soil and you're encouraged and you're strengthened by one another. And this motivating each other to love and good works has everything to be, do with being planted and rooted and connected so that you can fulfill God's purpose and promise in your life. Number three, in rapid fire fashion, the last part of that verse talks about meeting together. The last part of that verse talks about meeting together. So, so holding on to hope, motivating each other to love and good works. And then the third part of this verse, when we're talking about called, right, God has called us to hold up one another. Uh, uh, it, it talks about meeting together. And the word ecclesia, when you look at the, uh, the word church in the Greek, in the New Testament, the word ecclesia means an assembly. It means those that have been called out, those that have been called upon, those that have been gathered to unite. Meeting together to encourage one another. Meeting together to encourage one another. You know what happens when we meet together, we encourage one another. You know, I'm teaching a class at uh, Vanguard University and there's this term that we learned just the other day. It has, the term is neuroplasticity. It's a really intense term. It's intense for me too. I had to practice saying it. Neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity has to do with the connections in your brain. It has to do with the synopsis and the neurons and, and this inner, these canals that, 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 that kind of your brain wave, your brain, it, it, it flows up and down on and it releases charges and thought and thinking happens through these particular channels. And it leads to behavior. It leads to acting out or acting up or responding or acting appropriately in this way versus that way. It leads to to kind of guiding and leading our 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 defense mechanisms and our coping mechanisms and our ways of relating to each other things that we don't do things that we uh, should do as well as things that we won't do because they're not appropriate as well as the things that we could do because the opportunity arises and we take advantage of so this neuroplasticity it speaks to a capacity at a cellular level to make new synapses and to prune away synapses. In other words, things that used to make sense, there's a way that we can undo them, untie them, or disconnect them so that they no longer lead us to act in particular ways. In other words, our brains can grow and we can change. Our brains can grow and we can change. Did you want to know something else? Neuroplasticity happens when you come together with others, when you share story and when you hear story, your brain is changed and shaped and reprogrammed or realigned. Connections are made, new connections are made, and, new, and old connections are disconnected or discontinued. Because not only because you're sharing, but also because you're hearing. Change happens. Change happens comes in and through community. I didn't need a scientist to tell me that. Come on, somebody. We didn't need a neurosurgeon to tell us what we already know. That's just affirmation of what I'm reading to you right now. That's why the, the, the apostle wrote it. Look at what, what Romans chapter 12 says, and then I'll, I'll end here. Romans chapter 12 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world or the ways of thinking or the behavior, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then notice what it says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. 
already the scripture is calling us to live in such a way that we are changed and transformed into the image of Christ individually, corporately, and as a ministry, as a church, as a body. This church, the body of Christ. Stand to your feet with me real quick. You know, the end of this verse, the end of this verse says something really important. It, 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 it says something of, about maybe even something that we're experiencing right now. Notice the last part of this. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord's returning is drawing near. Especially now as the day of the Lord's returning is drawing near. Did you know in the past, one of the uh, email that uh, Pastor Josh Canales of Mission Ebenezer Church in Carson a general presbyter for the Assemblies of God, our Southern Pacific District, an email out. And he reminded us, just in the past couple of months, 102 fires, over 5 million acres destroyed. The quality of air in Oregon is worse than even the tool to measure it. It's beyond 500. Last time I checked, there were some areas in Oregon that had reached a peak of 700. There are major storms all throughout the South in Alabama and Georgia and Florida and Mississippi. Pensacola, Florida received 30 inches of rain in just four hours. And, he, and what, it, what he encourages us to do is to rely on the Lord, depend on the Lord, trust in the Lord, wait on the Lord, cry out to God and keep our eyes on him. And what I want to encourage you today, I want you to make your decisions based on hope. Hope in Christ. Hope in Christ. And you know where hope begins? Hope doesn't begin outside of you. It begins inside of you with a new heart. It begins inside of you with a new life. It begins inside of you with God's purpose and plan. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, that you know you belong to the Lord. And so as we conclude right now, one of the things I'd like to do is I want to give you an opportunity. I want to make an invitation. I want to make an invitation, give you an opportunity to have Christ in your life, to have the hope. I mean, a hope has a name. His name is Jesus. To open your heart to him, surrender to him, and invite him in. And that applies to everybody online as well. Let Jesus in. Let Christ into your life today. So I'm going to encourage you right now just to bow your heads, close your eyes, and repeat this prayer with me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I recognize that I have sinned. And I believe you died on the cross for me. You rose from the grave for the payment of my sins. I confess you today as Lord, as Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Take control. Give me a new heart and a new life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Amen. And God bless you today. And if you've prayed that prayer, we'd love to pray, pray with you and meet you and, and connect with you right after church. And uh, after church, there will also be an opportunity to pray with us here at the altar as well. So God bless you today. Go ahead and be seated for just a moment.